from New York City for our audience worldwide. Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, Fed officials teeing up a March hike as U.S. inflation hits multi-decade highs and retail sales slide the most in 10 months. We begin with the big issue, the Fed gearing up to hike. The March meeting is very much live. The March rate hike is definitely a go. Four rate hikes on the table. Four rate hikes. Four rate hikes. We're getting tapering, you're getting rate hikes and potentially balance runoff. That all in, in the space of 12 months is a considerable change to the monetary stance. The Fed has been ultra accommodative. The Fed is still super accommodative. Now it's all about the other mandate. It's all about inflation. They have a significant inflation problem on their hands. And they are going to chase this thing and they are going to hike uh, pretty aggressively. Well past time for the Fed to start tightening. You are moving from an accommodative Fed to a less accommodative Fed. And we're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. Joining us now is Crossmark's Victoria Fernandez, Morgan Stanley, Sri Sankar, and Chris Mamani of Lafayette College. Victoria, I want to start with you and start with the question, how much work the Fed has to do here? This line just crossing from the New York Fed President, John Williams, he won't predict what it will take to achieve the goals of the Federal Reserve. What do you think it's going to take? It's going to take quite a bit, actually, Jonathan. I mean, look, some of those clips they were talking about how accommodative the Fed is and they're removing that. But even if they do three, four rate hikes this year, we're still going to have nominal and real yields that historically are at very low levels. And so I think there's quite a bit of work to do. I do feel like maybe I'm a little bit more on an island compared to everyone else because I'm not so sure that March is 100 percent a go. I think Powell is going to be looking at some of these inflation numbers. And yet, Yes, we got large headline inflation numbers, but you look at that three month over three month number, that's actually peaking and starting to decline a little bit. And look, two months is a long ways from now when it comes to the Federal Reserve and the data that we're going to see. So I want to see a little more information come out before I say that March is a go. Victoria, what do you think will stop them? Every single official we've heard from this week has said the same thing. Even some of the most dovish policymakers on the FOMC, San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly, saying the same thing, March, let's go. What's going to stop her? Yeah, I, I'm not really sure that there's going to be one thing. I think they're going to have to take a step back. And if we get a lot more um, people coming in with the participation level doing better um, on the labor front, if we've got wages that start to settle down a little bit as those people come back in, if we see those month over month or three month over three month inflation numbers start to come down a little bit, maybe it doesn't necessarily mean they don't raise in March, but it may mean that if they raise in March, then there's going to be a longer period of time before they do the next Next rate hike. Remember, there is a tremendous amount of lag time before we see the effects go through the markets. And, and we also have to remember rate hikes have a very different feel for an economy versus the markets. And right now, I think they're looking more at the market. Sri Sankaran, there is an argument that the calendar might be on their side. Bank of America make this point. Core inflation is likely to peak in March 22, after which the year-on-year -year comparisons will turn highly unfavorable. After March, do you think, Sri, the calendar is on their side? I mean, I think we were in the camp that uh, the, the, the sequential inflation coming down probably buys them a little more, bit more time. But we've recently changed our views in the sense that LMM team, our economist team, basically are in the four rate hikes camp now. And we're also kind of baking in the back half of the year for the balance sheet reduction to also kick into play. So the bottom line, yeah, I mean, we think it's, we're more in the March camp now. And we expect four rate hikes and kind of in line with consensus, increasing the probability of a back half balance sheet reduction. Four seems to be the consensus now. Krishna, your line, either the pandemic gets resolved or we have a recession. Krishna, is it that binary? I, I, I think so. I think uh, so kind of articulating that the Fed is not going to be uh, raising rates in, in, in March, I think has to uh, have you make an assumption that they are data dependent. And I think we have heard from everyone that they really aren't data dependent. They are basically looking at the backward looking data and that is scaring the living daylights out of them. So I, I think it's a go in March. The challenge is if the pandemic doesn't get resolved with, uh, uh, with uh, kind of the prime age population already in the market as much as it possibly can be, there's just no way to solve the overheated labor market. So they will have no choice but to continue to tighten, continue to tighten 
until things break, and that's a recession. Krishna, the base case now is four hikes in 22. I think a lot of people looking at this situation and saying, surprise me, where's the upside surprise coming from? Just got a question from a Terminal subscriber saying, how about a possible 50 basis point hike in March? Krishna, where would the upside surprise come from? On rates, on the balance sheet, where can it come from? I, I think 50, while there is some probability to that, that would really be the nuclear option for them. So I think uh, it's probably not, you know, we are still going to go with the conventional ammo for a little bit. I think what may be on the, on, on the table and probably has a higher probability is to start a runoff uh, concurrently with the end of the taper and not wait till the second half of the year. I think the probability of that, if we see a couple more prints like this, uh, probability of that is probably going up. I don't think uh, the probability of not them doing anything is likely to uh, likely to increase any. I think the March is baked in. March is as cooked as it possibly can be. Shri, talk to me about the balance sheet and let's go through some numbers together. Matt Lazzetti of Deutsche Bank is trying to paint the following picture. He's looking for balance sheet reduction of 560 billion this year. Roughly 260 billion of that is going to come from bills. One trillion dollars more in 2023. They say we estimate the total drawdown in the balance sheet through the end of 23 amounts to somewhere between two and a half and three and a half 25 basis point hikes. Sri, the work you and the team are doing at Morgan Stanley, where are you on the balance sheet and are you largely in line with those kind of figures? Yeah, I would say that we're probably largely in line with those figures and also kind of agree with the comments that Krishna made earlier. So they were thinking about it, probably there is kind of uh, the probability that they're a bit more aggressive with respect to the balance sheet unwind this time around. So our base case is that you probably, they probably start going at uh, 80 billion, uh, split 50 across treasuries and 30 in MBS on a monthly pace. But that obviously is also a faster ramp up, not just the timing or the lag between when the rate hike and the taper, begin, taper ends and rate hike begins, uh, that window is compressed. But also once they start going, it's a faster ramp up over just a couple of months. And you get that balance sheet unwind kicking in on a monthly pace, which is much faster than what we got back in 2018. These are huge numbers, Victoria. And 2018 is the only real example historically that we've got to lean on. Do you think we can digest those kind of figures? One trillion in 23, 560 this year, which is likely going to be the back end of this year. You're right. These are really large numbers, Jonathan. And I think that the market can take it as long as things are done with enough setup, right? That we know what's coming, we can digest it beforehand, and they announce it. I think, though, people have to remember if we start, if the surprise is that we're going to start having the balance sheet runoff sooner rather than later, that is a form of tightening. So, are you know, are the expectations going to be four rate hikes and balance sheet runoff, which is actually additional? rate hikes that does the same thing, then I think that's too much and I think the Fed isn't going to take that step. I would anticipate maybe two or three rate hikes and start the balance sheet runoff. Those numbers, I think, are in line with what expectations would be. I think that would be okay, but I don't think you can do all those rate hikes and do those levels of the balance sheet runoff without causing quite a bit of volatility in the market. Sri, can I come to you on that as well and just ask you, do you think balance sheet reduction complements your rate hike call or replaces your rate hike call for hikes this year? <laughs> I think that's an important question, John, in the sense the way we're thinking about it, the Fed would ideally want the balance sheet reduction to give them uh, the flexibility to be a bit more slower with respect to the rate hikes. Whether that transpires or not, obviously, that is going to be more data dependent. But the way I would frame kind of Victoria's argument, I do hear where she is coming from. But I think the, 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 more, the way we're kind of leaning towards is that they want to get going with respect to both. And then the, the, the potential pivot or kind of slowing down with respect to either lever probably happens after they get going. So that's, that's kind of how I think about it. And to your original question, yeah, I mean, the way we're framing it, balance sheet reduction probably, I mean, at least the Fed would ideally want balance sheet reduction to kind of replace some of the rate hikes that they're doing, whether that eventually transpires or not. Yeah, I mean, we'll just have to wait and watch. Shri, how do you think they manage the situation considering they're sitting on so many T-bills this time around? Do they have to cap the runoff there? What do they do? I mean, I think the caps are going to be higher than what they have. And to some extent, I think the way we're also framing it, the Treasury also has some degree of flexibility with respect to which part of the curve they tap into. So, yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, the, 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 the optionality is just going to be that it's not necessarily QT being QE with a negative sign and duration coming back in full force. It's also that some of that incremental supply starts moving towards the, the front end. 
And just on the, the, the point in terms of the corporate credit background as well, I think that also gives them a bit more ammunition because real yields being so low and corporate bond yields also being so low, that probably gives them a bit more confidence that corporate balance sheets can handle at least the initial rate hikes faster and balance sheet unwinds. We're going to be talking about the credit situation in the next segment. Krishna, I wanted to come to you on this because after the retail sales print of this morning, this Fed stuck between a rock and a hard place. I can find people on Wall Street who thinks they're behind the curve, they need to do a whole lot more. I can find people on Wall Street who think they're so late they're about to hike into weakness. Krishna, what's the risk that they hike into weakness? I think there is substantial risk that they hike into uh, into weakness. But the question is, hike, hike into which weakness? If, the, if they're hiking into economic weakness, when labor markets are still rock solid and the uh, wage picture has uh, is showing a tendency of getting significant traction in terms of expectations, they have no choice. So yes, they are in a, between a rock and a hard place. But uh, to some extent, they are being left to clean up the fiscal job that we did, and that they may not have uh, as much flexibility as, uh, as we think they might have. Krishna Mamani with Sri Sankaran and Victoria Fernandez sticking with us up next, the auction block. Junk bonds rebounding, fueling the primary market to its busiest week in two months. That conversation next from New York. This is Bloomberg. Jonathan Ferro, this is Bloomberg Real Yield. It's time now for the auction block where we kick things off over in Europe with a record breaking week of sales. Issuance nearing 100 billion euros with offerings from Portugal and Cyprus leading the way. A quiet Friday following a busy week in the US with four high grade offerings Thursday, pushing supply towards 100 billion dollars. Just two weeks into the new year. And the junk bond market gaining some momentum after a slow start. Weekly volume approaching 7 billion this week, the most in roughly nine weeks. Back with us at a Discuss Victoria Fernandez, Sri Sankaran, and Krishna Mamani. Sri, I promise to come back to this, so let's do that now. The primary market looks pretty robust. I'm looking at spreads between double B and triple B really, really tight again. Is there any reason to be concerned right now from what you see looking through credit? Um, it depends on which part of credit. The way we're framing it, we would still uh, favor default risk over duration risk, which means we still hold a bias towards uh, preferring high yield over investment grade. But I think this dichotomy will get a little bit more blurred, or the lines will get a little bit more blurred as we kind of progress through the hiking cycle and the balance sheet unwind path, et cetera. So that's kind of one of the reasons why we're saying we do want to see some degree of price dispersion emerge, even within the, 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 the more credit-intensive portions of the high-yield market. And it does feel like the earnings story, at least the breadth of the earnings, may not be as strong as we get through the earnings season next uh, through the, the coming month or so. And at the same time, when we think about a hiking cycle, liquidity unwind, higher illiquidity premiums, et cetera, we do have to bake in or the, the risk is going to be that the market's kind of underpricing the impact that it could have on the most deepest uh, credit intensive portions of the market. And that's the pocket that we're seeing. We want to see a bit more of price dispersion. Sri, you know the exercise that a lot of houses are running through right now, they're going back to 2018 late 2018. Sri, as you see things, the difficulties we had in December of that year when the high yield primary market totally ceased up, do you think that was down to a Fed pushing rates too far, saying that we weren't at neutral yet, or is that down to balance sheet reduction? Where do you think the pain came from? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination where you had the Fed was, was kind of further down the path with respect to the, un, with the rate hikes, and then you had the, the balance sheet reduction kick in, so you had the combination of uh, both the, the tighter financial conditions and uh, a seize up in some degree of liquidity there. But I think the lead up to it was also important because for the most part of 2018, what we saw was high yield outperforming, triple C's outperforming within high yield and so on. And it's just in a matter of a month, we just pretty much gave up and retraced more than all the tightening. I don't think that a 2018 playbook is really what we're anticipating. The point that I'm trying to uh, make is though that uh, there is a fair degree of complacency that everything which is more default sensitive or growth sensitive should hold in well because the earnings backdrop is reasonable and it's just the longer duration pockets which are going to be hurt more. I think that is the case for the next few months, but the transition from duration into worrying more about default risk could happen faster, maybe not to the same extent or abruptness as we saw in 2018, though. Victoria, do you sense the same complacency in the same pockets of the market? 
Yeah, we've seen it for quite a while now. I mean, you look at where spreads are just not on high yield only, but on investment grade as well. And they have been so tight um, over the last six months to a year. We've had a little bit of widening out a couple weeks ago, but they're right back to where they were at some of these lowest levels in 12 months. And look, we're focusing more on the higher quality names, right? That's what our clients are relying on. They're looking for the income, the cash flow. But you look at that gap, like you were mentioning originally, between double B and triple B and how small that gap is. I think we're going to start to see that widen out a little bit. As yields go higher, obviously that puts a little bit more pressure on high yield. I don't think we're going to see the defaults that we had seen back in 2018. Balance sheets are stronger now than they were then, but I do think you need to be a little bit cautious. I think the widening will be faster there than we do on investment grade. And look at the banks this morning. I mean, we're talking about earnings and how that affects the spreads. You look at the JP Morgan bonds, well, City. We didn't see spreads move much at all. I was talking to the, the traders at UBS, and they don't anticipate to see any spread movement really on any of those names. So I think for now, things will remain pretty steady, but if yields get too much higher and we get that two handle on the 10 year, then perhaps we start to see high yield widen out a little too much. 176 right now, Krishna, is it fair to say you're struggling to get excited about corporate credit at the moment? I'm a credit person at heart. I, that's what I've done all my career. So it's kind of breaks my heart to say this, but I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't make a case for credit for the life of me. <laughs> Here's what the challenge is. Spreads are at their tightest level, and we are facing basically a binary situation where if inflation expectations in the labor markets get traction, the, force will be, the, the Fed would be forced to do all sorts of things that it has never contemplated over the last uh, 10, 15 years. So what we should expect is a more abrupt, not less abrupt, more abrupt change than what we saw in 2018, because the underlying structural issues in 2018 were very much in place and it was more of a liquidity play this time around the underlying structural issues are on the other side we are talking about inflation expectations in the labor market for the first time that's not that's not the sort of environment where credit spreads at their current levels can make you feel really good about things krishna these are things that we talk about they're just not priced there is a belief that it's not 2018. I share that view with you. There's also a belief that the Fed can't back away when financial conditions tighten this time around because inflation and this backdrop is so different. I hear you. I'm with you. But then I look at the pricing of this bond market. I look at tens at about 176. I look at the forward curve and I'm thinking this is a market that still believes the Fed's not going to get much more north of 2% over at the Federal Reserve. They think this story fades. I'm looking at 30s at 2.1%. Krishna, the market hasn't bought into this, has it? And for all the talk of a hawkish tilt over at the Federal Reserve, I mean, let's get real. This is probably the most dovish central bank in the history of central banks with headline inflation at seven. They're still at zero. They're still buying bonds into the end of March. So, Krishna, I hear you too. But when do you think the penny's actually going to drop? Well, I, I think the, the, the penny has started to drop in the stock market. Just look at that. And I think that is... That is coming to the credit markets in spades in not too distant the future. The, 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 the bottom line is that, you know, we will face an environment where they are tightening policy rates, they, where they are withdrawing liquidity in a significant way, and, uh, the, the, and, and spreads going into that are at their tightest, uh, tightest level in a, in, a, in a long, long time. And having gone through a period where credit growth was quite substantial. If you look at what credit growth was in the first two quarters of 2020, you know, it reminds you of lots of scenarios where things ended up pretty badly. So yes, the rates markets are not discounting it, but the rates markets are not discounting the, 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 the uh, a potential rate rise or uh, policy tightening because they're looking at what the outcome would be if things go bad. And the outcome then would be rates at significantly lower levels. So that, it, they're probably telling you that far more than the fact that they're not worried about rate rise. That's a very, very good final point. Krishna Mamani is going to stick with us alongside Sri Sankaran and Victoria Fernandez. Still ahead, the final spread, the week ahead, featuring a host of global rate decisions and fresh U.S. housing data. That conversation just around a corner from New York City. This is Bloomberg.
Live from New York City, I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. It's time now for the final spread. Coming up over the week ahead, China GDP figures coming up on Monday, plus U.S. markets closing for the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. Central banks in Japan, Indonesia and Turkey all holding their first-rate decisions of the year. And finally, U.S. housing starts coming on Wednesday, followed by jobless claims on Thursday. Final thought now with Victoria Fernandez, Sri Sankaran and Krishna Mamani all still with us. Victoria, just to pick up on what Krishna said just moments ago, this yield curve, the typical playbook, atypical playbook, is the Federal Reserve hikes too much, kills the hopes and dreams of the future, curve flattens, cycle over. Is this time different? You know, I hate that phrase that this time is different, but I do think there is an element here that is different than what we've seen before because so much of it is being driven by the pandemic. I know Krishna said earlier, right, we have to get out of the pandemic and in that or we have a recession. And I think when you're looking at the yield curve, that's really driving it. The, the headlines around the pandemic are driving that. If we can eliminate that, help the supply chains, bring some of that inflation pressure down, then I think you have a different yield curve. And that was not the, the pressures that we saw in the yield curve previously. Look, 170 is a key level. If we close below 170, retracements are telling us we can go back towards 150. But if we keep going above 170, 173, then we're looking at a, at a 180, a 190 on the 10-year Treasury. So I think we have a lot of room here on where we can move, and we're just going to have to see what the data is telling us. Two's tens right now, just south of 80 basis points. Let's get to the rapid-fire round. Three quick questions, three quick answers. The White House Fed picks, does the Congress confirm all of them. Does Congress confirm all of the White House's Fed picks? Yes or no, Victoria? Yes. Sri? Yeah. Krishna? Yes. How many hikes this year? One, two, three, four or more. One, two, three, four or more, Sri? Four plus balance sheet reduction. Victoria? Three. Krishna? Three. Headline inflation year end. What do we end with on headline CPI in America? A three-handle, a four, a five, a six, a seven? Take your pick. Give me a number, Victoria. I think we end around three and three-quarters percent. Krishna? Three. Three? Yeah, I mean, below three. Hey, guys, great to catch up. Fantastic to hear from all three of you. Victoria Fernandez, Sri Sankaran and Krishna Mamani going into a long weekend stateside from New York City. That does it for me. I'll see you next Friday. This was Bloomberg Real Yield. This is Bloomberg TV.